we don't know if there might be a gene therapy potentially for Alzheimer's disease. There's so much that we just don't know. We're beginning, you know, really an explorative um, conversation around different targets and what's appropriate and what the timing is. That's exactly what precision medicine is about, right? It's getting to precise patients, what they need, when they need it, and how they need to receive it so that it's targeted to them. And some of what we've done is, number one, we have not acknowledged, I think, the shift in population that has happened. We're still built, our medic, much of our medical research is built on the idea that we're at a 80-20 white to non-white population, when in fact, this year, we're at less than like a 60-40 shift. And when we look at research, that's approving medications and is considering social determinants of health, genetic factors, comorbidities, and all of that, if we don't have enough population data on people who are more likely to experience um, those specific conditions, we are sort of whitewashing the data. Hello, and welcome to Informatics in the Realm, the podcast that's designed so that even my parents can understand and take part in the dialogue surrounding biomedical informatics. I'm Kevin Johnson, physician and informatics researcher at the University of Pennsylvania at KB Johnson MD on Twitter. And I'm Harris Bland, senior project manager in biomedical informatics and PhD candidate in human genetics at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And you can find me at htbland21 on Twitter. So on today's episode, we had two special guests. First, we had Dr. Consuelo Wilkins, Senior Vice President of Health Equity and a Professor of Medicine at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Consuelo is a great friend and one of the leaders in finding new approaches to inviting marginalized and disadvantaged communities into clinical research trials. And if you don't know what marginalized and disadvantaged communities mean, you really need to listen to this podcast. We also had Stephanie Monroe, JD, Vice President and Senior Advisor of Health Equity for Us Against Alzheimer's, a national advocacy group that aims to diversify the movement to cure Alzheimer's. After working as the Assistant Secretary of Education for Civil Rights, Stephanie pivoted to raising awareness about the impact of Alzheimer's health disparities on communities of color and women. In continuing our series on health equity, we had a really great discussion about how to diversify and how to create equitable clinical trials, which honestly can seem like a huge undertaking. And our guests did a ton to help understand the roadmap toward achieving that goal. For sure. Uh, it seems like a huge undertaking to try to recruit people from these diverse populations. But what Stephanie and Consuelo discuss really bring this opportunity to start engaging in communities that have often been left out of these clinical trials, and they might need them the most. They bring up these things that really are tangible, helpful, and have a lot of utility as long as we're able to just consider doing the work. So without further ado, let's get into the episode. Okay, welcome to Informatics in the Realm. This is going to be a great episode. Um, we have some people here who really know a lot about the particular topic. As always, the pure goal of this podcast is to make sure that we talk about issues that are pertinent to biomedical informatics in a way that my parents will understand them. So I'm Kevin Johnson. Uh, I have run this ship alone, and now I luckily have a co-pilot or a co-commander in Harris Bland. Harris, you want to say hi? Hey, I'm Harris Bland, co-host of Informatics in the Round. There it is. And we have two outstanding guests. Consuelo Wilkins, you want to say hello? Hello. I'm Consuelo Wilkins. I'm a physician scientist at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, where I lead a number of programs in health equity and um, have also have a background in, in research in Alzheimer's disease. And like both of our guests who are going to be, you know, vice presidents of modesty, Stephanie Monroe, do you want to say a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, yes, Stephanie Monroe, and I am vice president of Us Against Alzheimer's and senior advisor on health equity um, and access. I'm also a former um, Assistant Secretary of Education, where I ran their Office for Civil Rights. And again, modest. 
But we'll hear a lot more about that as I think we sort of unpack this topic. We typically have a musician on the episode. For this episode, as well as the last episode, we're going to add music that we think is pertinent, and that will cover our country music component of the podcast for people who are dying to hear it. Jane Bach, unfortunately, couldn't be here today. So the topic that we thought we would address today is, is a very serious one. For many of us who have aging parents, we're going to use some of that experience as an example. But fundamentally, this is a topic around precision medicine and different communities. And many people don't know what the definition of precision medicine is. It's actually uh, you know, when President Obama described it, he used the term precision medicine. Other people who are thinking about this from the patient's perspective often call it personalized medicine. But fundamentally, it is using the characteristics that are unique to a particular subpopulation of people that were previously thought to all have the same disease to identify either new diseases or specific therapies that are targeted to that subpopulation. There's a slightly more concise version of that definition in the Oxford Dictionary, but this is my sort of aggregate version of a couple of other people's definitions. The challenge with precision medicine is that as long as everybody is a part of a group who gets tailored therapies or gets uniquely diagnosed, it feels equitable. But what we're learning is that there are challenges. And we have two people here who are really experts in helping us to sort of unpack those challenges and how we can actually move forward. So I'm going to start with you, Stephanie. Um, we were talking a little bit about what's been happening with Alzheimer's therapy and some of the concerns that have been raised. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit and obviously rely on some of the work that Consuelo has done and published in, in um, recent journals about that. So what's the issue with Alzheimer's and that relates to precision medicine? Thank you. Well, the I think the the biggest concern is there is, frankly, still a lot that we don't understand about Alzheimer's disease. We know that all people who have Alzheimer's have amyloid plaque in their brains. They have what they refer to as like plaques and tangles. But not everyone who has um, amyloid in their brain develops Alzheimer's disease. So we're trying to differentiate between amyloid that might cause Alzheimer's and what's there. Maybe it's a protective factor or whatever. I'm not going to pretend to be the doctor today, although I have been known to play one on TV. Um, <laughs> but we, you know, we just still don't know a lot about it. We know that it often accompanies people who have vascular conditions, um, diabetes, heart disease, things of that nature. Um, we know that um, people um, will often begin to have signs that can be seen in the brain even 20 years before the first significant symptoms begin to appear. What we have not done is, I think, a good job of examining how Alzheimer's presents itself in different populations. Um, we use a gene called APOE4, which is the predominant gene that we see in white Europeans. And that's the gene that we look for pretty much in everyone. Um, I'm sure Consuelo will go into more detail about that. But we also understand that in Black Americans in particular, there's another gene that seems to, to have a higher indication um, of predicting Alzheimer's in Black Americans. And that gene is called ABCA7. It's not really routinely ever checked. We are testing everyone against what the white European Alzheimer's disease. And just I know, why, why would that even be? I mean, if we know that there's two or more variants, why would we only select one? I'll chime in. I'll say, um, you know, it really gets to, I think, a fundamental inequi inequities in structure. So, you know, when you think about genomics in particular, um, so many of our reference data sets are uh, composed of primarily people of European descent. So um, despite them you know, not being the majority of the population in the world, many of our data sets, especially in the United States, have you know, 80 plus percentage of the people who are included um, are, are people of European descent. And, and that's um, due to some recent improvements. At one point it was you know, 94, 95% of of the databases or were com composed of people of European descent. So if you're 
actually, you know, making discoveries and identifying uh, genes and variants based on that population, then that's what you're going to see. Hmm. Um, but I think, you know, it's a more nuanced conversation, though, because when we start to talk about um, inequities, um, we, we also want to make sure that we're not focusing so much on genes and genomics, because um, social factors, environment um, play important roles. And so um, as we start to talk about things like, you know, differences in how people respond to medications, it's right. not going to be all about genes. It's also about the, um, the the social environment, the um, the comorbidities that people might be at increased risk for because of the environment and social circumstances, and also you know epigenomics and methylation changes that are there. So it's it's not as just clear cut as you know there are different genes perhaps that people might have. I see. But I would say it is important, though, we don't know if there might be a gene therapy potentially for Alzheimer's disease. There's so much that we just don't know. We're beginning, you know, really an explorative um, conversation around different targets and what's appropriate and what the timing is. That's exactly what precision medicine is about, right? It's getting to precise patients, what they need, when they need it, and how they need to receive it so that it's targeted to them. And some of what we've done is, number one, we have not acknowledged, I think, the shift in population that has happened. We're still built, our much of our medical research is built on the idea that we're at a 80-20 white to non-white population, when in fact, this year, we're at less than like a 60-40 yeah. yeah. shift. Mm. And when we look at research that's approving medications and is considering social determinants of health, genetic factors, comorbidities, and all of that, if we don't have enough population data on people who are more likely to experience those specific conditions, we are sort of whitewashing the data. I hate to use that word, but that's what we're doing. And so when we look at clinical research and recent research around Alzheimer's, um, they've been lucky to get like 3 to 5% minoritized populations and the data that's used to assess treatments and also to identify biomarkers. And the last Alzheimer's drug that was approved, that is a very expensive drug, that there was some controversy about whether Medicaid, Medicare would even pay for the drug. Um, the clinical trial that that drug uh, involved was only 1% African-American participants. What? 1%. Yeah. Wow. So how can you be precise? You can't even generalize that, really. So frankly, what that means is that the largest clinical trial for this, and there's nothing really special about Alzheimer's, but the largest clinical trial is going to happen once the drug comes to market, once we have shots in arms and we're going to wait for data, we're going to wait for adverse reactions and things like that, or you know, lack of effectiveness. And that's, I think, really um, troublesome. I think you're hitting on something that has so many different ways you could approach and attack the issue. Uh, and I think whitewashing is actually a very appropriate term um, because I think about how clinical trials start. Uh, it starts with access to that clinical trial, which often a lot of minority populations or underserved populations don't even have access to normal, regular preventative care. So to even get to that point, you have access to a clinical trial to be a part of a clinical trial is it has two or three barriers even up to that point hmm. so i mean do you do you see that uh as is accurate or do you see that uh clinical folks who are who are offering the clinical trials um for these drugs like pharmaceutical companies are they targeting um trying to get people to partic participate or do you think that um it's just that there's a trust barrier already there and so there's people who are just saying i don't want to be a part of that clinical trial and so there's not even an opportunity to gain that trust. I'll, I'll, I'll chime in and say I completely agree that, you know, access is an issue, especially if we're talking about access via the health system. But I would push it, um, you know, push the challenges, you know, up a few levels. So even <laughs> before we, we talk about um, access to a trial. The studies aren't even designed with knowledge and expectations around equity or uh, addressing um, disparities. So 
we we know we've known for a very long time that black african american hispanic latino latinx latin a populations are at higher risk more likely to get alzheimer's disease have worse outcomes get diagnosed later i mean there's so many disparities so mm. and the populations who bear the greatest burden of the disease should be front and center when we're designing studies to understand, prevent, and treat the disease. So the studies need to be designed with that in mind. Uh, and so we shouldn't be just reliant on, you know, access to care um, when when it's time to think about those studies. Now, it'll still be challenging even when we um, when we design it in the right way. But if it's not designed, um, you know, considering, as, as Stephanie mentioned, ABCA7 isn't written into the protocols. We're only assessing APOE. Um, and and so, so again, we have flawed study design that, that's really not intended to be answering questions broadly. And I would also push the, um, the, uh, the percentages of the population. So, you know, if we're doing, you know, good science, it's not just necessarily about the local um, population or the national population. If, if we're talking about the world population and Alzheimer's disease is a world, um, mm -hmm. is an issue for the world, you know, right. less than 10% mm -hmm. of the world population and people of European descent. I mean, we're talking about, you know, half the population right. being people of Asian descent, you know, 15 to 20% being people of African descent. And so, again, we, we're making decisions, we're creating evidence and data, uh, generating data based on population that uh, reflects, you know, a very small percentage of the world population. Consuelo, help me with something. When you say that the studies are not being designed with this focus in mind, for people who've never designed a study, what would you do differently? I think some people imagine the way you do this is you tweet out or however, calling all people who have this disease, we would like you to be in this study. And then there is some magic that assumes that we do something to make sure we have an adequate number of people from all the different groups. Isn't that properly designed or is there mm -hmm. more to it? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it, most clinical trials um, have been designed um, as if they were basic science studies um, or animal studies. And at the end of the day, after the scientists have developed their protocol, they're just going to order the mice. You know, they, they need, <laughs> you know, they need a few gray mice, a few brown mice, some white mice, and then they can just do their study. And so they design their trials. It's like, okay, now we have it all figured out and we're going to test this. And now we're going to order up some white people, some black people, some multiracial people, you know, maybe we'll get some gender diversity, maybe not, they haven't thought about that yet. But, you know, that's, that's how they're designing these studies. They're not designing the study. So if I'm designing a study where I know the, the population, the condition being studied has very well-known, well-established disparities, then I'm designing a study that has that at, at the forefront. So I'm not saying the population of the country needs to be represented. I'm saying that the population that's most at risk, most likely to have the disease, I, I want the study population to look like that. So if Black people are twice as likely, if Hispanic, Latinx people are 1.5 times as likely, then that's what the, the study population looks like. And then I also need to have those social um, determinants of health that I'm collecting, that I understand the social factors, the comorbidities. Like I've designed all of that into the, the study, like where do people get their care? How do I access them? Um, you know, is the, the study team diverse enough that I can even get that level of thought into the protocol? I mean, it's, it starts well before we're, we're trying to tweet to a population of people who are not on Twitter uh, and if they are on Twitter, they're not there to get uh, enrolled in studies. And I think the other thing um, is when it actually hits the ground, right, the lack of thoughtful design becomes very apparent. So studies have protocols that include certain people and exclude certain people and conditions. They try to create, I would say, 
a very sort of healthy population that gives them the best opportunity to be successful in moving a drug toward approval. So they want it to be sort of clean, but it goes out in very sick populations. <laughs> and I understand that, right? Yeah. They don't want to cause harm to people when they already are sick, even though like that's those are going to be the population. So an example of a typical Alzheimer's study, they would put out the, come on in, you know, go to churches, come on in, we got this study. Um, we'll get you a reimbursement for, you know, we'll, we'll reimburse your transportation. We'll give you a $25 um, gift card to Target. You might come in for a six-hour visit at a site that you've had to get transportation to, you've taken off work for, um, wow. you have to go through a bunch of tests, some of which will be paid, some of which you have to come out of your pocket, you have to have insurance. You might make it through that first screening, and then you find out, oh, I'm sorry, you have diabetes. So you can't come into this trial. Well, 40% of black people gone. You, you, you can't come in because you have diabetes or you have heart disease or you have other conditions that are deemed not appropriate for a particular trial. And so we need to be very intentional about understanding what is nice to have and what we really need to do. We should be designing trials to include as many people who look like the actual population that the medication, whatever is gonna go into. Um, people often travel distances. If you think about rural America, they're not getting access to neurologists and these health research centers. Um, think about people who are um, in really urbanized centers. Often people talk about, you know, there's a lack of trust. Well, what we found, I went out and did um, a play. I took it to 27 cities in the U.S. And at every place we um, interacted with about 37,000 people, mostly all Black Americans. And we asked them, if they would be interested in getting more information about clinical trials. And they said, yes, like large majorities. And then we asked, has anyone been asked to participate in a clinical trial? And 80% said no. So the first barrier is we have to ask. And the reason we're not asking people is for a variety of reasons. One is because people have a bias. They think there's a greater likelihood of African-Americans and Latinos sticking with a trial. Um, they're concerned that they're going to have to explain away, frankly, some of the atrocities that have happened in those populations that people are going to come in and say, well, how is this different from Tuskegee? And people aren't comfortable with those populations. Mm. So there's just a lot of stuff that we're not building in. As Consuelo said, when you don't have adequate representation in the workforce when you come in, um, and the only time you see African Americans or Latinos is behind a broom, you're not going to necessarily feel very comfortable that this institution has your best interest at heart. But we got to get it up. 20% of people with Alzheimer's are Black. And again, 1%, 3% of people in trials are Black. We got to do better. No, I agree. That's awful. I want to build on the one point um, Stephanie made. All great points. Not that that's just one I want to build <laughs> on. But, um, you know, the... Um, we we talk so much about um, getting communities ready or, you know, building trust and getting them to trust us. And, you know, I've talked about this before, like, you know, are we trustworthy enough? And I think part of part of what we don't talk enough about are um, the barriers at the researcher, the research team level to engagement, like, you know, there, there are certainly challenges and barriers as far as access and asking people are not asked, but um, the point Stephanie made about people not being prepared or not wanting to have to answer questions about uh, prior research abuses and exploitation, like that is definitely um, a gap, a lack of skills, like people don't want to um, be able to respond to that. And they, they also think that if you ask that question or someone asks you that question, that they don't want to participate. Um, and, and that's not true. People want you to acknowledge, hey, you know, listen, you are absolutely right. There have been some atrocities that have happened in the past, might still be happening now. But, you know, this is what we're doing. This is how we're committed to your safety. This is how the study has been designed with you in mind and how we're going to be transparent and share the information. You can do all of that and still acknowledge um, that, you know, the, the, the history um, that we have with research uh, and people need you to do that if you if you want them um, to 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 find you trustworthy enough for them to participate. 
so let me just ask this question. Thank you so much for that. Um, so in in both of your opinions, you look at this new drug where, Stephanie, you're saying that out of a representative sample that should have had 20% or more African-Americans, they have 1%. Consuelo, I know that the work that you've been doing with all of us and with the most recent grants that you've been about around are all about improving our ability to use informatics tools and other approaches to improve the representativeness. So what's going wrong? Is it literally that funders are allowing people to get away with a 1% sample? Is it, and I see you're nodding, which means that must be it, which is really, really awful. Is it more than that? Is it, I mean, what's going wrong and what needs to be fixed? It sounds like it's not. Yeah, Stephanie said one of them is asking people and what else? I, I do think that we have to accept that um, recruiting uh, people from marginalized and minoritized groups, um, some of whom may have uh, limited resources, uh, requires a different approach. It requires more money, more time um, to do it. Um, it's not a cookie cutter. You don't, you know, send a tweet. You don't flip the switch on the study and people are in line to participate. It does take more and different work. Uh, and so um, so we need to accept that. But people actually know how to do this work. They just aren't um, they aren't doing it for varying reasons. But the point about accountability is really important. So. Um, Who's holding um, folks accountable? So if you have an NIH funded study and you don't meet your accrual goals, even though you've mapped it out, even though it's been 25 years since NIH has said that you have to have, you know, gender and, and racial ethnic diversity in your studies, like no one comes and shuts the study down when you don't achieve that level of diversity. The pharmaceutical companies um, are, you know, doing their studies and presenting their data with very little diversity to the FDA. And despite the FDA knowing that, you know, these populations are overrepresented with the disease, but underrepresented in the study, they are still approving these studies. So no one is holding them accountable. Yeah. Just to make that, that, that point, I mean, FDA as, as the regulators, I think that's where the buck stops. And in 2018, according to the FDA, they approved a record of 59 new therapies among 53 drugs um, that were in U.S. trials. Among those 53 drugs, only 12 had enough data to provide some knowledge of the drug's effects across races. So the FDA is well aware, and they're approving mm. drugs with these low numbers. So that's the challenge. Yeah, and the FDA has, I mean, they, they've recently issued some, you know, statements in support of diversity in clinical trials and well thought out plans and, you know, guidance for um, studies. But and it, if you're still going to approve therapies without diverse populations, uh, then there's there's no accountability there. Yeah. there there's there's none. And and I think, I mean, I, you know, we, we have to take that accountability even broader. I think, you know, where, where are the journals? Um, if, you, if you can get your study published in the New England Journal of Medicine and Lancet and JAMA and wherever else that has the highest impact factor without having an appropriately diverse population, then who is holding them accountable? You don't, you don't have to, you don't have to do anything. You just show up with your data with 1% black people when they're overrepresented with the you know burden of the disease and get it published and get it cited and get it approved. You you just brought up the thing that I, I've been sitting here and thinking a little bit about because I can't uh I agree completely about the funders. And I, I even think um, when I have submitted uh, annual progress reports, putting people into the buckets so that they know what our population looks like is so uh, minuscule that we can't really even show the diversity if we had it. Um, but you brought up the, the journals, which makes me think about how Recently, not too far ago in the news, um, it came up that uh, Alzheimer's research has had flaws over the years, uh, significant flaws that has now called into the in question the um, 
the accuracy of the data and the science that we've had for the past 15 years. Uh, so, you know, with that in mind, how far back now are we or how far set back are we um, with the knowledge that we thought we had that we really don't about Alzheimer's research, especially in minority populations? Yeah, no, that's a great question and great point. I mean, you know, with data being fabricated or <laughs> altered in some way, um, I, I mean, I do think that there, in, in the particular case of, you know, um, amyloid deposition, tau deposition being hallmarks of of the study, I do think that that we have enough evidence that these are still the hallmarks of of the disease. Um, I think, and and that. I would say maybe loosely connects to the study that that we published last year that showed in um, Black, um, Hispanic, and Asian people, um, they were 30 to 50 percent less likely to be amyloid PET positive uh, compared to white people. So, so we if we're these drugs that we're talking about are monoclonal antibodies, they're uh, you know against amyloid, and so if um, if they're going against amyloid, there's a presumption you have amyloid in the brain. Uh, and and uh, Harris, as you pointed out, there's there's evidence that you know, some of that data in the past that we've relied on has been fabricated or um, inaccurate. Um, and now we're seeing these populations of people who are who are more likely to have Alzheimer's disease are less likely to have amyloid deposition when we do this special kind of brain imaging. So what does that mean? Does that mean that something different is happening? Um, I mean, I personally think that there's probably more uh, vascular pathology that's happening. So that the the burden of amyloid that you need in order to have symptoms of Alzheimer's disease um, is lower in the presence of the, these vascular changes. Um, but but yes, we we don't know. Uh, we still need to study it. We still need to understand, um, and we and we definitely need to have a higher bar of what we're accepting as um, as science. I mean, yeah. it's just really not good science, and I think that's part of for me mm. the the issue with the accountability is that we have just accepted this underrepresentation in clinical trials. It's, oh, it was too hard for them, or oh, the black and brown people didn't want to participate, so we couldn't do it. It is bad science when the people who have have the have a greater burden of the disease are not represented in the study. You you cannot say that this is discovery for a general population of people. Absolutely, and it's it's mind boggling to me that you know even when you're in conferences that are data scientists. People are so excited, as they should be, that we have these two, three new therapies, uh, two approved and one coming down that all have the same theory of, of, of action that may not work for Black people, that may not, you know, we're either going to get it when we don't need it, or we're not going to get it at all. But everyone is running to this new, shiny new thing. And what's going to happen to people who want to do actual research and find therapies that work for Black and Latino people? You first have to acknowledge and be willing to say this theory may not be the right one. And there is so much resistance to having that honest conversation. That's step one, so that we can make sure that there's research dollars that flows to other theories, vascular and other opportunities to get a drug that actually works and addressing what is Alzheimer's and how it's presenting itself in these other populations. Well, let me ask this question too. I thank you so much for that, Stephanie. So when you when one does a trial, correct me if I'm wrong, but typically, sort of putting on my informatics hat, there is a role for informaticians and others to be a part of a data safety monitoring group. Should we have or do we have anything that looks like an a way to enforce accountability for representativeness or overrepresentativeness of data? Consuela, do or Stephanie, do, do do you know? Do trials ever get asked to create that kind of a group? I can't say that it's it's done at any scale that I'm aware of, but certainly, um, you know, you you can monitor it. We do so, um, you know, as part of our 
Recruitment Innovation Center that Paul Harris and I lead. And Paul is an informatician, uh, although I also try to play one on television occasionally uh, <laughs> with, with his slides. You know, there, there's certainly ways to track um, enrollment by specific um, demographics, including race, ethnicity, gender, zip code. We, we can right. track all of those things, um, but, but it's, it's, it's rarely done um, in a way that leads to, you know, halting or pausing the study. I will say that, you know, one um, once one Alzheimer's study that I'm involved in now, new ideas where we're we're doing uh, amyloid uh, PET imaging. We have um, you know, the the goal for the study is seven thousand people, hmm. two thousand of them uh, black or African American, another two thousand Hispanic or Latinx, and then the other three thousand are can be any other racial or ethnic group. So it is designed to overrepresent um, these two populations that um, suffer um, disparities from Alzheimer's disease. Now, in that study, again, we turned on the switch and had you know sites enrolling. Um, out of the gate, more people are being enrolled in the in the other cohort, the population of people who are not black. Uh, African American, Hispanic, or, or, or Latinx. Um, so we actually paused enrollment in that third cohort because we're saying, no, that's really not the intent of this study. We're focused on these two populations and we want this other group to be, you know, recruited at the same time for comparison and you know other factors. So so we actually have had a pause for more than a year and rolling. Wow in that um in that third cohort and um and and so 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 it can be done and, and certainly we're not the only ones to do that but um you know the our strategies and you know Peggy Dilbert Anderson at UNC and I have been leading the recruitment efforts around that but we we really have focused on again some of the things that that Stephanie already mentioned like transportation um the study has been um, a CMS coverage with evidence development. And so some of the traditional things that we do in clinical trials, like, um, you know, arranging transportation and, and giving incentives, we can't do because the study is being done in traditional clinical practice. So we actually had to jump through a lot of hoops to even be able to pay the copay for the imaging. So it, it's been quite challenging. So did your funder have a fit? When they found out that you were slowing down enrollment because you felt like you weren't getting adequate representation, so the the, the study actually um, uh, has multiple funders and including uh, a foundation with um, manufacturers of the amyloid tracer pet tracer um, and the Alzheimer's Association and the American College of Radiology. So, um, so so they all actually were aware we were. Um, you know, preparing them in advance to many of the challenges that we were going to have and face uh, with uh, recruiting this population, especially you know during the pandemic and some of the shifts there uh, in recruiting. Because you know this is actually so new ideas is um, you know part two of ideas that only recruited less than 10% uh, people from marginalized groups. So, so they know that they didn't do a great job to start in some of the challenges. So, so I think they, from that standpoint, were um, you know, expecting that, that there would be challenges, even though we had some new strategies. But, but there are also you know, structural barriers built in. So I'll give an example for, uh, because again, this is a, a coverage with evidence development study. It's happening in clinical practice. Medicare Advantage, uh, we have had many challenges with getting the amyloid PET imaging approved through Medicare Advantage. Now, you may or may not know that um, Black and Hispanic older adults are more likely to be enrolled in Medicare Advantage. So they're, they're actually, in some ways, is almost predatory approach to getting them enrolled in Medicare Advantage, and they go after them because they're going to provide actually some additional resources, uh, fulfill some of their social needs, 
But then when it comes time to get, um, you know, imaging approved or get access to more expensive drugs, there are actually lots of barriers for them. Medicare Advantage is more mm. likely to deny access to see a specialist um, or um, imaging, specialized imaging, et cetera. Like these things are, uh, are, are more likely to happen in the Medicare Advantage population, which is disproportionately people from marginalized groups. You don't need to be a specialist. We'll just yes. go ahead and give you extra aspirin cream and you'll be fine. <laughs> yes. And, and, and black yeah. and Hispanic people much less likely to see a dementia specialist already and then add in the, the Medicare Advantage issues. Because often they don't exist in those communities. I mean, that's the bottom line. We've got, I mean, often in yeah. many of these lower income communities, frankly, you don't even have gynecologists. So mm -hmm. a neurologist? Right. So we just we need to do some infrastructure. There's just so many issues of layers. We need to build our infrastructure better. We need to get more people that are going into African Americans and Latinos going into medical school to graduate from medical school. I believe that our rates are similar to what they were in the 60s in terms of graduation. Entrance is high for black men. But they're not coming out. Yeah. So we've got all kinds of issues like that that we need. I did want to mention one thing because I'm sure that the visit your, your your viewers are thinking. You know, these pharma companies, they, all they want to do is get get their drug approved and get get the shots in arms and get money. Right. But we do need to understand that, um, you know, clinical trials is where cures happen. You know, the first person cured of Alzheimer's will be in a clinical trial. These pharmaceutical companies um, not supported by the federal government um, invest and lose billions, if not trillions of dollars on research and development. And then they find a molecule that they think will work and they run it through this process and maybe gets approved. And then they only have so many years for a patent where they actually own the drug. They get all the profits back from the drug to try to recoup their losses and other drugs that have come across their pipeline. Um, so I think part of this systemic change is we need to look at, I mean, we love generic drugs because it makes it more accessible to people. But it also, the yin and the yang of it, it all puts more pressure on companies to charge more upfront so they can try to recoup as much as they can of their investment before it goes generic and people who did not invest anything get to profit from it. Um, so that's something that we need to think about in terms of access and tying those things together. No, I was just going to say quickly, uh, in terms of, of other potential uses of informatics, though, to solve some of these these challenges, you know, when we're starting to talk about these structural issues, being able to pull in, you know, data from different sources and areas. So uh, in this new ideas, you know, we we identified communities that we thought were going to be higher yield because they had a higher percentage of either black or Hispanic older adults. Um, and the, um, you know, the number of dementia specialists in these areas, access to the tracers. So, you know, we were pulling in all of this data to create maps and identify places where we, we thought we should put our efforts. Uh, but then we ran into some of these, you know, other issues like, okay, well, there are more dementia specialists in this area, but mm, they're all either at an academic institution or they're in the suburbs. So they're not in, in the in communities um, that are near or adjacent or easy to to get to or access to. And so, you know, finding ways to pull in the data there. We did pre-screening with the dementia specialists who came into the study and uh, agreed to be, you know, site investigators. Um, and, and so pulling, having them pull and extract their the data on their patient populations, you know, that that's a way to use the um, informatics but it probably needs to be more nuanced than that because some of the things yep. that we saw also was, you know, they pull it, they tell us this is, you know, these are the num number percentage of, of patients that they've seen who are Black or African American. Turns out, you know, they've seen them one time or um, they <laughs> don't have, you know, a longstanding relationship with them or they are willing to see them, but it's a nine month wait to, to get in to, to, to yeah. see them. Or they don't have, you know, people who, you know, speak their preferred language. So, you know, I think there, there are many ways that we can think about using informatics to better understand like site 
capacity, feasibility, and some of the barriers that people are going to face. I feel like I'm supposed to say, preach, Consuelo. <laughs> well, I mean, truthfully, um, with simulation, the, the kinds of things that Stephanie just described, where somebody adds an inclusion criterion that essentially knocks out 40% of the eligible group, that's totally able to be simulated using any data, whether it be the All of Us repository that Sensuel, I know you know a lot about, or many of the other sort of classic biobanks that have a lot of electronic health record data. You could just run that inclusion experiment and see where do people fall. You could even do the thing that you're describing in terms of issues with transportation. You could really look at the entire structure for setting up these clinical trials, assuming that we can get people to agree to participate. You can actually obviously simulate that part as well if you have a sense of likelihood of people having trust or other reasons not to agree. Right? Right. And I, But I wanted to make sure that Harris gets to go because I interrupted. Oh, no. Actually, I just will follow up with that and say, uh, I wonder if this is an issue that is a U.S. centric issue, or if we're seeing this in uh, in the rest of the world, where you know, like the UK Biobank. I know that a lot of people who um, have tried to do research through the UK Biobank, it's great, but it's still very white European. Um, so I wonder, you know, and also with pharmaceutical companies, is this central or centric to America or other world areas or other areas in the world are they struggling with the same issue? Well, I think, you know, Europe, um, well, England in particular, because they have a one single payer system, they have certainly access to everyone who's being cared for as data. And so if they're not doing it, a system like the United States, where I don't even know how many different payers are coming in and through, um, it's going to be much more challenging. Um, so I think, you know, we need to collect that data. We have lots of opportunities. We have opportunities to be as precise as we want to be in getting people, right? Because we have all that data. Um, we have data on prescribers. We know who's caring for people. We know what comorbidities they have. We could use that Medicaid, Medicare Advantage data, um, uh, veterans data, whatever, if we wanted to do that and very precisely invite people who we know fit certain characteristics, who we think are uniquely qualified to participate in trials instead of, you know, reaching 10,000 people with the hope of getting a thousand of them enrolled in the trial, which is what we typically do. So I don't know if we want to do that, um, but we certainly have the capability of doing that using, using data. Um, I think data is great. For, it's interesting for people to be able to use uh, data for research, but I'm always more excited about data that could be used for actionable results. And I think we have not used data in the way that really inspires action. I, for example, run a national Alzheimer's disease index where um, I have data. I'm able to pull up a map and show you where everyone who has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease lives in America. Um, I'm able to see what their hospitalization costs are, what comorbidities they have. I was able to see, for example, that a person with Alzheimer's, um, I, I believe, and I'm, I might be misquoting myself, but I believe their annual cost of that person was like $13,000 in terms of medical costs, because most of the costs for Alzheimer's are um, care. But if that person happens to have diabetes and have Alzheimer's, it's $43,000 a year. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. So wow. prevention, which we don't do a good job of preventing. But now we are seeing, I mean, the National Alzheimer's Plan Act just added prevention. Who would have thought of it for Alzheimer's disease since we know what leads <laughs> to it? Let's work on preventing some of these things and let's work on addressing social determinants. Um, Dr. David Satcher, former Surgeon General, said if we were to begin to really focus on um, prevention and uh, resolving uh, barriers uh, to care, uh, we could reduce as many as 40 percent of people. Um, experiencing um, health disparities in the country. And that's huge. So, so Stephanie, um, I know that you've published a paper recently called Discussing Inconvenient Truths About the Lack of Generalizability of This Research to Minoritized Populations. Are you getting any traction? Are people learning something and thinking about how they should fix this? And what do you expect to happen? I'm hoping something happens. For me, it was really a labor of, law, of, of love. It was something I just needed to say out loud. <laughs> Well, um, you did that. I, I did that. Um, and I'm going to be using it um, uh, to be able to discuss these issues. But I think it, 
I'm trying to bring light to researchers who don't always connect um, in a single place. We'll have like one-offs. One person's over in one conference. Usually when we talk about equity issues, it's either right before lunch when people are trying to get out to eat or it's right before we close. So we need to bring equity with our uh, population change front and center. We need to stop pretending as if we have reached conclusions and data based on you know, something that cannot be generalized to the public in any way, shape or form and be honest about that. Um, I would love to see papers lead with, you know, this is our, our abstract based on research that included and have what that inclusion was. So I know who do I really, is this for me or is it really for other people? And maybe there's some, I think they should lead with that. We should know exactly who these reports um, are based on and what the data says um, so that we don't just assume um, as I think many people do, that is relevant to all populations. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. Harris, I wanted to to also, you know, go back quickly to your um, your question about, um, you know, are, are people around the world doing better? I think it's variable. You know, you look at some of the studies, especially in Alzheimer's, and and you'll actually see that that their diversity primarily came from outside of the U.S., and then, you know, next, you know, drug you see, right. they've made more of an effort to increase the diversity of, um, you know, the population, the sample recruited from the U.S. But, I mean, we, we also have to recognize, like, you know, where's the money being made? And because of, of mm. um, you know, Stephanie pointed out the, the U.K. health system and, you know, many, you know, health systems um, around the world aren't set up um, the way that the U.S. is. And so... The, the likelihood of making a lot of money uh, is is uh, is in the U.S. And so, you know, pharmaceutical companies are um, enticed and intrigued by trying to get their studies, you know, approved, um, and their, their drugs approved um, in the U.S. because, you know, they, they, they can make more money. But um, and, and so they sometimes will focus their their study population on 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 the U.S. population, but uh, you know, I I, I think you, you can, it's it's uh, possible to have a more diverse um, sample if you're recruiting uh, broadly. But then there's you know the contextual factors and and um, access remains an issue in many other places as well. You know, the recruitment piece is something we we have shown is possible. So I was on um, a committee with NIH NIH recruitment. Um, science study that we did. We brought in people from lots of uh, areas and sort of took, you know, took note of recruitment strategies and retention strategies that worked. And it's a wonderful guidebook. I'm sure it's sitting on someone's shelf and needs to be dusted off and actually applied. Um, <laughs> but there was a company um, that I worked with giving them advice on how to recruit for trials and he brought together a bunch of people again from different disease states and they actually did what we suggest that we had learned about recruitment strategies that work including incentives uh, workforce all those things and they ended up recruiting 80 percent minority populations and did not take more time it took more intentionality mm -hmm. it took a budget up front mm -hmm. not just you've created a trial and you've recruited 90 percent of your white European people of descent, and then you got to go out and grab some other people of different shades um, to fill in the gap. And that cannot be it. I love the idea that you shut down recruitment of the majority until you, and that way you incentivize people to actually, yeah, you need to go out and make these connections to people. So there are these guys, I'm getting tired, frankly, of people admiring the problem and admiring the woulda, coulda, shoulda, what we should have done. And we know what to do. We know how to do it. It's been proven. We need to do it. Yeah, I, I love uh, what you just said there. And I think about um, being more intentional. I, I do have a friend who uh, she works for uh, a group that helps clinical trials enhance their diversity. And she said the same things. It's it's possible when you're more intentional about it. Um, you know, it's uh, it's more than just making it a buzzword um, and a feel good. It's reaching out and and utilizing possibilities that you you wouldn't consider for the average clinical trial person, which unfortunately means the average being the white male or female um, in the population. 
I want to, before we wrap up, the one thing I keep thinking about that I've held off on, and I think it's a, a good way to close, is we've spent the past three years uh, of a pandemic trying to get people to trust medicine and healthcare again. And that's because we really needed people to get vaccinated. So we had a, a valid reason. But I think we're clearly showing there's another reason to be scrutinizing uh, pharmaceutical companies and healthcare organizations um, because of a long history of exclusion. So how can we reconcile those two thoughts of being able to uh, discern and, and scrutinize pharmaceutical and healthcare and research, knowing that they, uh, they're they exclusionary, but also recognizing that there's the need there too for things like a global pandemic. And either one of you can take that. Um, thanks for the complicated, complex question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, to, to end with, you know, I, 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 hopefully Stephanie will will chime in as well. I'm not sure how you know well thought my um, my comments will be here. I I do, you know, I, I do think that my view of why clinical trials. Um, are important. Also, um, you know, have has you know that view has a, a justice lens um, and a need. Mm. So I think that, um, especially in the United States, with the way that um, you know research is funded through the federal government, et cetera, I think that we have a right to participate in research in clinical trials. Mm. And um, and and I think that gets to the accountability that the researchers, the research institutions, the funders, the publishers should be held accountable for making sure that everyone is able to exercise that right and has the ability and opportunity to participate um, in a clinical trial um, if it's about the population that they're from or includes a condition that they have or are at risk for. And so I, I think that we need to reframe, you know, how we think about clinical trials as um, something, again, that's that's akin to designing the study and ordering the mice. And in this case, you know, the way that we've designed mm -hmm. the trials is that you don't just, you don't even have to order the mice. You just design the trial and then you say, hey, you know, well-resourced, you know, highly educated people who've not been historically exploited by research, come on in. Yeah. Yeah. That was a deep question. <laughs> you asked. I, I really get stumped. As a lawyer, I usually have something to say at all times. But <laughs> I think um, I mean, I think I would say a couple of things. Part of the accountability, I mean, we need to make it number one, we need to make it easy for people to get to yes. We need to explain mm. to folks why it's so important. People don't, when they go to Walgreens and they go to grab a vitamin off the shelf, although vitamins aren't research really, when they go to grab an aspirin off the shelf, they don't think about, gee, I wonder what kind of research was involved to uh, get this thing here. They don't think about that. It's just there. They need it. Somebody told them it was good to take it, so they're taking it, right? Few people, when they get a, a medicine, read that. 0.5 point physician insert that comes in the package that you open and it's like 48 by whatever. We don't read that. It's not written for regular folks to read. We need to make it easier for people to understand what's going in their bodies, to have conversations mm -hmm. with their doctors. I mean, I, I, I'm a victim of this. If I go into my doctor and he says, you know, I've got this pill or whatever that'll solve this problem. I don't ask him. Gee, was this research on black people? How many people were involved in this study? What are the side effects? I don't go through all that with them. I'm like, oh, thank you very much. And I leave. We got to change that. You know, we almost need like a TikTok for medicine, something that makes it easily yeah. grasp, you know, something that people can easily grasp and understand and then make decisions, make have conversations with your doctor about this stuff. But I think, you know, maybe we need to have the FDA put labels front and center. This medication was tested on, put the percentage there. Maybe it leads to less people taking it. Maybe it leads to people, you know, talking to the doctors about it. Um, I don't know. But we don't right now, we don't design medications and give information to people in a way that they can truly 
access it. Because the first way of, of access is health literacy and being empowered to understand more so that you even know what to ask. And I think that's something that the government could could help with unless you're trying to keep it at a certain level. And I think uh, the thing that I, I was thinking about as we were as I was listening to you all is that uh, America and, and we we've touched on this a little bit um, in other podcasts before, but we keep seeing patients more and more as consumers rather yes. than as patients. And uh, I think if we could get groups like the FDA to start really holding their uh, the feet to the fire a bit more about diversity and about education, I, that would be going a long way to help uh, people be able to trust uh, pharmaceutical organizations and healthcare organizations more. And I think what you guys have said before um, in this podcast, you know, recognizing that at some point we do have to address the inequities that continue to happen and have happened in our past in healthcare and acknowledge them. Um, and we see that it gets very uncomfortable when we acknowledge them, but how much more transparent can you be by acknowledging those inequities and the, those harmful experiences so that we can move forward? Uh, I think that's really critical. And, and y'all have talked about that. And I think if we don't do it, we're going to continue to see this lack of diversity in these populations uh, for things like drugs yes. and, and treatment. Paris, can I just clarify? So are you suggesting that we treat people more like patients or more like consumers? Oh, uh, more like patients. Hmm. I'm reacting to that internally. I think I think it's maybe a more nuanced okay. um, conversation because I think the role of the patient has been traditionally one where, where there's a power imbalance. Ooh, yeah, good point. And and so I think, you know, that aspect to, that Stephanie's talking about, you know, you go into the doctor, you don't ask questions, you just say, okay, you leave. And, you know, often we think about consumers as having a choice and deserving, you know, no more information mm. and having sort of kind of rights to question and refuse or select. And, and, and so maybe there's somewhere in between where we, where we recognize that people are vulnerable, especially if they're having health challenges or at risk for health conditions. And so, um, but, but that doesn't mean that they don't um, deserve um, to have the opportunity to ask questions, to know information, mm -hmm. um, to, to be in it, um, to be to be able to to make decisions about our trustworthiness yes. as as health care providers, clinicians, and and researchers. I think that's interesting. I think uh, when I think of consumer, I think of and maybe uh, it's not a synonym, but it's similar. Customer, which means you're paying for a service, and it gives you rights, but it also gives me uh, a capability to deny you of things that you actually deserve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there, I, I think of consumer a little bit differently, but I do agree with your points. So we need another word. Yeah, we do. We do. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been such an interesting topic, seeing the news about this drug and understanding a bit more um, about how uh, the, the clinical trial was designed and didn't include populations. I think a lot of people don't understand that. So I think we've taught them a lot. Um, and final words from both of you, Stephanie, you get to go first. What's the last thing you want to tell people? I mean, I think we we have a right to be really excited um, when we have uh, novel treatments and Alzheimer's space in particular. Um, before this last year, it was 17 years before we had a new treatment that came to market. And wow. so people rightly are really excited that we have found something that appears um, to be able to work. What we have to make sure we do is not drain resources um, from other discoveries that would maybe enhance treatments that are available to populations that weren't um, included here. Where there, and we have to be willing to have those tough and honest conversations, especially as, as, as data people. So that would be my, um, my final word. I mean, I think there's just a lot that we need to do, that we can be doing, that we can be excited about how far we've come, but we've got a long way to go in this disease in particular. Yeah, if I had to emphasize something that we've talked about already, I would say 
you know, we really need to strengthen um, efforts around compliance, transparency, and accountability in trials. And, and there are many different individuals, organizations, and sectors that have responsibility for that. From the researcher, the research institution, the funder, the publishers, you know, there are a lot of people, um, the, the regulators, uh, the regulatory bodies, FDA, we talked about all of that before, like that there, there needs to be, you know, a lot of, of people involved in, um, in that compliance and accountability. And maybe if I could say one thing about um, something we haven't talked so much about, and that is recognizing the, the community assets and knowledge. You know, mm. there are, um, you know, solving um, inequities in general, specifically improving recruitment into clinical trials. There are lots of resources, assets, and knowledge that are in communities, and uh, we don't have diverse enough study teams. We are not collaborating and partnering with community organizations, but perhaps more importantly, we're not acknowledging the deficits and knowledge that we have as, as researchers and research teams, and we're also not acknowledging um, those strengths within communities and how we have excluded um, knowledge and erased you know, different ways of thinking and knowing and being. So thank you both for being, being here. This was amazing. Well, that was interesting because, you know, I think our previous episode with Evan Thornburg really primed this conversation. Don't you agree? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, we, we didn't necessarily have bad research with Alzheimer's, but we do have to admit it's been incomplete. And, and I found myself thinking three words, which is leaving people behind as one of the themes that we don't think about with precision medicine and equity. Yeah, it, it, for me, I thought about how Evan's conversation was a lot about misinformation and disinformation, but there's also that hole, that black hole of where there's information completely missing uh, right. that I think is this huge gap. Um, and I think back to what Consuela was saying about how we as researchers have this responsibility to the public, especially those who are marginalized um, and who have been excluded from research to really right. start engaging them more often and make sure that they understand that those gaps exist and that we have really missed the the target often um, for these communities. So I think it it takes some humility to do that, to acknowledge the past and the present. Um, but without that, uh, I don't think we're going to be able to take action on our part. You know, I agree. Thanks. You know, many of our listeners are wondering, where is Jane? Where is the songwriter? And interest in getting these two topics, we really were unable to schedule everybody, but we need to fix that. However, for this particular episode, I have the perfect song. There was a really terrific songwriter and great friend of mine, Rhett McDaniel, who was on episode one of this podcast in the first season. And Rhett is a phenomenal songwriter and one of many phenomenal songwriters in Nashville who rarely, if ever, get a big break. He just got his first break, which is a song on a, on a new album. So I'm really excited for him. But he has a song that I think characterizes sort of the essence of what Consuelo and Stephanie were chatting about. And that is the fact that many of us try to organize our thinking of people in these structured ways. So for example, on a tombstone, it's your date of birth and your date of death. Um, but there's a dash in the middle. And that dash represents all of the color, all of the flavor, all of the nuance that is life. And that's actually what precision medicine is all about, the dash. And this song is all about the dash. And I think people will really enjoy it. I love this song. It was one of these songs I couldn't stop singing when I first heard it. And I hope you guys feel the same way. Anyway, thanks for listening to this episode. To hear about new releases, find us on social media at info in the RND, the round on Twitter, or on Instagram, or on threads, or on TikTok. And if you have any questions or ideas for things that you want to hear about for new episodes, message us on any of these platforms or email us at informaticsintheround at gmail.com. See you later. Goodbye. I have returned for song number three. Um, I actually had some requests for a song in the comment section. I'm going to do my best to honor that. Um, 
It's another song that I wrote with Adam, and as with most songs written with Adam, they sound better with Adam. (laughs) So I have asked him to do a virtual duet with me on this song that we wrote together. Uh, It's called The Dash. So, Adam, if you're ready, we're going to give this a go. Well, I was going through some boxes in the house where I grew up when I found a birth announcement hidden with some old junk. I was born at 602 on the 14th of November. The son of John and Ruth In a hospital in Denver Neath that a yellow clipping That announced their wedding day Next to a picture of my dad With his first Chevrolet There was a snapshot of my mother In an airmail on the low Bound for where my dad was stationed With a letter that she wrote and as I looked through their things, I started to realize that being born and being buried are just two points on a line. And the numbers that they carve on your tombstone with a chisel don't mean as much as the dash in the middle. Someday someone might be looking Through the things that once were mine And I hope they read the story Written there between the lines Of a man who lived a life Anyone would be proud of Never scared to fight for what is right Not afraid to love And as I look through my things I hope they start to realize of being born and being buried but just two points on a line and the numbers that they carve on your tombstone with a chisel don't mean as much as the dash in the middle it wasn't walking through that front door or out the back to leave It was the last walk through this empty house that meant the most to me. And as I locked the door behind me, I felt something new begin. Cause the shorter something starts, something else must surely end. And the numbers that they carve on your tombstone with a chisel don't mean much as the dash but they don't mean as much as the dash they don't mean as much as the dash in the middle